Hi everyone, how are you doing? Um, so before I start, I'd just like to take a second to uh, thank the NGO committee uh, co-chairs for um, allowing me the opportunity to speak today and recognize His Excellency from Suriname and His Excellency from the State of Israel, uh, Deputy Consul General Amir Sagi, who is with us today, and of course the Church Center for the United Nations for hosting this discussion. So um, I'm going to focus on the role of child brides uh, in the context of conflict, uh, which is a unique form of child marriage and child soldiering and an oft overlooked aspect of this repugnant and yet enduring phenomenon. Now, I use the word enduring with great intent, for as long as mankind has been in, in, been in existence, he has been subjected to what us PhD scholars call uh, the Hobbesian state of nature. And by this I mean that mankind, without a common power to keep him all in awe, are, is in a condition which is called war. And as such, war is of every man against every man. So despite Hobbes' belief that a common power will bind humanity together into societies which will create lasting peace and security, a peaceful and secure world is certainly not the reality for the vast majority of the world's population today. Terrorism, insurgency, civil strife, displacement, and war indoors, and violence feels as commonplace today as it did in Hobbes' time. And although it may take a different form, it is nonetheless the reality that we exist in today. The recent terrorist attacks in Paris, the refugee crisis in the Middle East, the cartel wars of this country's southern border, the continued struggle for sovereignty across the African continent, a fractionalized Southeast Asia, and resurgent aggression, te aggression and tension between Eastern and Western Europe barely scratches the surface of the violent state of nature in which our so-called civilization exists. So you might be asking yourself, why is this important and what does this have to do with child brides? And I would tell you absolutely everything. Because there is one universal truth about conflict that holds steadfast over space and time, and that is this truth. Women and girls are always its primary victims. On World Population Day this past June, the United Nations Refugee Agency and Secretary General Ban Ki-moon highlighted the role of women as the most vulnerable populations in times of conflict. The Secretary General reminded us that women and girls caught in humanitarian emergencies are at far greater risk of abuse, sexual exploitation, violence, and forced marriage than any other group. Of course, it's important to note that child brides are not a new phenomenon. For as long as we have waged organized warfare, women and girls have always been excessively victimized as part and parcel of the plundering and looting of invading armies. History is replete with examples of the of wives and daughters of slain warriors being reappropriated by the victors, relegated to a life of servitude as domestic slaves and sex slaves, forced into lives where their existence is contingent upon a threefold measure, cooking, cleaning, and child care. Now, according to international law, child marriage is defined as the informal or formal union between an individual before the age of 18. It is considered to be a matter for human rights, having been enshrined as such in our 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, our 1962 Convention on Consent to Marriage, Minimum Age for Marriage, and Registration for Marriage, as well as the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Yet they remain, yet they account for one in four registered marriages in the world today. And mind you, I said registered marriages. An estimated 41,000 girls under the age of 18 are married each and every single day, totaling 15 million worldwide each year. 15 million girls, consider that number. 15 million is slightly more than the number of military casualties suffered in World War I. 15 million is almost three times as many Jews as were killed by the Nazis in the Holocaust. 15 million is the equivalent number of Chinese who starved to death at the hands of Mao between 1959 and 1961 during their Great Leap Forward. 15 million is the population size of the nation of Kazakhstan and Guatemala. And I don't mean combined, I mean separately. Or consider this. The 300 girls abducted in 2014 by the African terrorist group Boko Haram, who suffered forced conversion to Islam and who were sold into marriage with radical jihadists fighting the front lines, represents just 0.00002% in your fraction of the 15 million child brides facing similar fates each and every year. Yet their story not only captured the intention of the entire Nigerian nation, but the world. What about the other 99.9998% 9, 9, 
Why do we ignore their suffering? Why do we not stand up for them? It's too often in our approach to the world's problems confronting us today that when recognizing the burdens of the few, we neglect the torment and distress of the many. Ending the travesty of child marriage, as holds true for all forms of modern slavery, means understanding that Medusa's many heads will not be defeated by concentrating our efforts on attacking just one, but rather attacking all its forms, be it legal, cultural, historical, religious, or by way of conflict manifested. For just as our increasingly interconnected world enables us to better solve our social maladies, it also equally enables those who choose to preserve them. I'd be remiss if I did not point to the plight of forced marriage in the context of boys and men. UNICEF estimates that 156 million men alive today were married before the age of 18, 20% of which were married under the age of 15. And yet these numbers do not even begin to take into account those boys and girls forced into unregistered marriages. It does not even begin to touch upon the boys and girls victimized by the focus of my remarks here today, that of child marriage in conflict. Because as we say in the abolitionist movement, slaves do not, rather they cannot, raise their hands to be counted. This can be said to be even more true when we discuss those that exist behind enemy lines. And child marriage is just that. It is slavery in its purest form. There's no debating this point. The forced marriage of children in conflict is a form of child soldiering. And child soldiering is a recognized crime of enslavement. Child marriage does not only corrupt the moral fabric of our societies, it also has serious consequences for the world's female population, as measured in terms of health, education, social development, and economies of countries, because we know that states thrive when women are afforded equal opportunities, which is why the he for she movement is so incredibly important. And although child marriage is illegal in over 150 states, it remains an ever-present form of enslavement in the world today. The abuse of these laws finds refuge in legal loopholes permitting parental consent, as well as the cultural belief held in many societies, both past and present, that adulthood is defined by the development of certain degrees of physical maturation or a child's passage into the stage of puberty. But it is safe to say that a cultural relativist argument is quickly losing ground to the increasingly apparent and stark reality of the consequences of the crime of child marriage as it has other forms of institutionalized oppression, including racism, anti-Semitism, political dynacism, colonialism, genocide, authoritarianism, homophobia, and other manifestations of slavery, sex crimes, misogyny, and gender inequity. But like the aforementioned ideologies and dogmas, child marriage has yet to be eliminated. We have yet to truly come together and take the necessary action to defeat it. It would give me no greater pleasure than to declare today that a diminishing acceptance of child marriage as a conventional form of cultural idiosyncrasy is the greatest means to an end, but it's simply not. In an extensive and well-researched report on the topic of child marriage published by World Vision in 2013, we now, it was revealed that in the 21st century it is now conflict more so than culture, which is responsible for the perpetuation, uh, perpetuation of child brides. And conflict is clearly not a characteristic of our current existence, which we are lacking. It is therefore not unexpected that we find that those countries with the largest number of child soldiers and child marriage are also those countries which rank highest in prevalence of fragility, instability, violence, and vulnerability. In fact, one in nine girls in the developing world where conflict is most common are married before the age of 15. So you should not be surprised that India, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Brazil, Ethiopia, Pakistan, Indonesia, the DRC, Mexico, Niger, Burma, Yemen, Syria, Somalia, Sudan, and South Sudan are the worst perpetrators of this crime. In these countries, violence is not only endemic, but systemic. It's often the case in situations of conflict that the true extent of atrocity is typically unknown to the abatement of hostilities. And even then, many, if not most, of the horrors committed die alongside its victims or remain secreted away by its victimizers. But there are some things we do know about child marriage in the context of conflict in the modern day and age. Child marriage and conflict occurs for two reasons. The first takes the form of marriage to escape conflict. The second takes the form of marriage to support conflict. And where both might be considered as a better outcome than the current situation by the families of the child, and in some cases, even the child themselves, which I will address further in a moment, neither will ever yield a positive outcome for the child, his or her family, the religious, tribal, cultural, ethnic group from which they hail, or the communities, the societies, the states, and as a result, humanity as a whole. 
Given that we now face the greatest refugee crisis in the history of mankind, 60 million displaced people scattered across our earth, it should be no surprise that we've seen a rise in the form of the first, uh, a slight rise in the first form of child marriage, that is child marriage to escape conflict. We find it increasingly common among Syrian refugees that families are giving away their girls at a higher rate than at a younger age than usual in hopes of providing a better life for them beyond the camps. The same can be said of any number of countries across Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, where refugees and internally displaced persons, where for refugees and internally displaced persons, being temporary is a new permanent status. The second form of child marriage, that is when girls are forced to marry into conflict, is also increasingly evidenced in large part by the growing radical Islamist front encroaching on the civilized world today. The phenomenon of child marriage was popularized in conflicts that swept across Uganda, Liberia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone over the past three decades. In these places, rebel fighters would kidnap young girls, some not even yet at the age of puberty, and take them as bushwives to serve their personal needs and maintain the campsites in the front lines of their insurgency. We know that thousands of girls in Sierra Leone Civil War suffered this fate alone. These girls were not only abducted, but repeatedly beaten, raped, and impregnated for the purpose of creating the next generation of soldiers. Today's modern Islamist terrorist organizations have followed this pattern. We've already discussed the example of Boko Haram, but they're not alone in this acceptance and implementation of child marriage within the ranks of their soldiers. ISIS not only recruits and trains young men to be jihadists and suicide bombers, but they also recruit young girls to serve as their jihadi brides. An estimated 400 boys and girls are believed to be in the Cubs of Caliphate branch of the terror organization. Girls as young as nine are recruited from ISIS terror strongholds, taken from families in support of the movement, adopted into the group as orphans of slain jihadi warriors, and in some cases, as we've seen with the Yazidi people, they are simply abducted by force. The Syrian Observatory of the Human Rights reports that over 300 Yazidi girls have become the spoils of war for the jihadists. These girls are sold for $1,000 after forced conversion to Islam and then sent to the front lines of the insurgency where they are used for the purposes of breeding the next generation of ISIS troops like cattle on a farm. But it's not just among their own and their surrounding population that ISIS is recruiting its child brides from. Like modern human traffickers and predatory pedophiles, ISIS has turned its attention to the internet to recruit its victims, many of whom now come from the Western world. Consider the story of the two Austrian girls, age 15 and 16, who after engaging online propaganda highlighting a Disney-esque version of the Islamist war and tweeting with fighters they thought were on the front lines, ran away to Syria in 2014 to serve as the jihadi brides only to find themselves forced into a life of servitude and sexual <coughs> exploitation. You're not alone. Reports of 16-year-old British twins that same year, as well as three more British girls, is eight, girls ages 15, 15, and 16 the following year, all of whom were lured away from their families and enslaved by their captors upon arrival. They all fall under the definition of child brides. And it's not just ISIS turning to online recruitment. Al-Shabaab convinced two girls in 2011, ages 14 and 15, to travel to Somalia for the adventure romance of a lifetime. And I can tell you that neither adventure nor romance awaited them when they arrived. Furthermore, it has been reported on more than one occasion that the Palestinian terrorist organization, Hamas, sponsors mass weddings for its fighters to teen and even prepubescent girls as a recruitment tool and an appeasement mechanism. And to think, that these antidotal reports are only what we hear about, the sliver of evidence which comes to light. Because we have to stop and consider the millions upon millions of stories which likely do not, and how dark that hole must be. I wish I could conclude my remarks today by telling you that the problem is getting better, and there is a simple solution or a quick fix to the plight of forced marriage, particularly in the context of war, but there is not. It is true that the Special Court for Sierra Leone, due to the atrocities committed in that civil war, ruled in the case against the leadership of the Revolutionary United Front that forced marriage is a crime against humanity, unique and separate from other forms of sex crimes and slavery, and that in doing so, an extremely important legal precedent has been laid. But nothing has followed from which to further fortify this law and to make it into a more traditional, customary role in our governments of the world. 
It's also true that a global push to end child marriage over the past 30 years and its inclusion as a goal for the UN's 2030 Sustainable Development Goals has proven to uh, has provided critical traction in regards to increasing awareness about and providing the impetus for actions taken against its propagation. But this success is minimal at best, and it means nothing to the millions of children who remain in bondage through marriage today. And to them and for them, we are obligated, in fact, we are compelled to do better than we are and to take whatever measures necessary to secure their freedom. I can only encourage you to take what you learned here today as a starting point for your continued self-education of this travesty, to spread the knowledge you gain to others, to look for opportunities to get involved and support organizations and efforts working to end child marriage so that maybe one day an end to the enslavement of our children by marriage is a future we will make our present. I'm gonna conclude my remarks today with the words of one of my heroes, the 19th century British abolitionist William Wilberforce, who when fighting against the global slave trade of the African people once remarked, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you did not know. Now that you know, what choice will you make? What choice will you make for the child brides of our world? Will you look the other way, or will you fight for what is just, what is moral, and what you know is all righteous? Thank you for your time.